the Gospel is Luke 11, 1 through 13. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 11th chapter. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we, forget, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given, search and you will find, knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. First of all, I just want to say thank you for letting me come to share. Um, this is a beautiful church. I've never been here before, but um, I really like it. I think we'll start. There's a video. Um, if you, if we can go ahead and start with the video. I have not seen it, but I hear it's good. <laughs> pretty informal, so I don't have like a real formal speech. Uh, I can talk about Habitat for a really long time because I love my job, um, but I will keep this short, not too long. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about Habitat first for people that are not aware. Um, Fremont Area Habitat for Humanity has been in Fremont for, this is our 26th year, um, so we've been around for a little while. Um, we are a Christian organization and our mission, uh, mission statement is seeking to put God's love into action. Fremont Area Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. Um, our, our focus, if you're not familiar, and one thing I want to emphasize anytime I talk to people, is that we help, we partner with families to build homes. Um, we, when we're done building the home, they have to help build it. They have to purchase the home. It is not given to them. It is not free, and there's still a big misconception um, everywhere that the homes are free, but they are not. Um, they purchase them for what it costs us to build them, so they have a mortgage payment. Um, 
Right now, they're, they're 30 year, 25 to 30 year loans, just like anybody else's mortgage payment. The difference is, is that ours are 0% interest, which makes it more affordable. And um, because we use a lot of volunteer labor to help build, that also keeps the cost down on the home. So our whole purpose is to make that home affordable for them. Um, when our homeowners, as they're building homes, uh, if it's a single adult in the home, they have to put in 250 hours of what we call sweat equity. <coughs> um, if there's two adults in the home, they have to put in 350 hours. They also have to attend classes. So we do classes on budgeting, nutrition, um, crime prevention, home maintenance, just a wide range of things because uh, many of our homeowners, of course, they have not owned a home before, but most of them, nobody in their entire extended family has owned a home. So they don't know a lot of things that other people take for granted. Um, since 1993, we've built 84 homes in the Fremont area, um, serving 434 people. Um, 289 of those have been children. We are currently getting ready to start on two townhomes, which will be four homes, four additional homes that we'll be building. <coughs> Sorry, my allergy stuff always hits. Um, we, we normally have about 20,000 um, volunteer hours annually to help us both build our home and in our Habitat home store, which helps us raise money for us to build. Um, that's kind of general on what we do. As far as, um, <coughs> I need to brag on one of our homeowners. Our very first homeowner um, was Trino Nuno. And he has paid off his loan because he's been there. Um, at that time, the loans were only 20 years because the, the, the amounts were less. But he um, purchased his home. All their children, they had four children under, this, under six years of age. Um, their oldest son, who is now an adult, um, has completed dental school and has his own dental practice in Omaha. And the next oldest son, <coughs> excuse me, um, is a physician's assistant in Norfolk. So um, they have spoken in, at events and things for us to tell us that they do not feel that they would ever have gotten to the points where they are if they had not been in a Habitat home and had that stability so they had a place to study and focus on what they were doing. Um, so I just always have to talk about them. As we go into the, just talking about the flood, um, it's been, a little over about four and a half months since that happened. Um, it feels like a lot longer than that to me. I don't know why, but it seems like a long time ago. Um, but it also just feels like it happened yesterday. Um, if you'd come to Fremont and drive through, and I've, I tell people that come in from out of town to help us, if you look around, it doesn't look like anything happened. You don't see, like if a tornado, you don't see buildings torn down. You don't see things like that. Um, the damage is inside homes. So it's not until you get inside homes that you start to see um, the damage. And even people that live in Fremont that were not in the affected area, a lot of people don't realize that there are still many families that are not living in their homes or are living in, uh, thank you, <laughs> or are living in um, unhealthy conditions because there's mold growing in their homes um, or are camping. Um, in a camper next to their house just so they have a place to live. Uh, they just don't realize it because it's not, uh, the place where the flood was hit the most was um, a lower income area of Fremont. And a lot of people just don't regularly go down there so they don't see it. So it's not until you go into somebody's house that you see what's going on and when you start talking to those people um, and they're really to a point now where they're getting um, discouraged and frustrated and um, a lot of people are feeling very lost as to what to do. We had many, many groups come in initially um, to help and we still have groups coming in. Um, so it, when this happened on March 14th, um, our offices where we are located were not affected, but we were evacuated because they thought it was going to come to where we were. Um, so we had to close down and leave for the day. 
Um, so our staff immediately went out to the shelters and started helping in the shelters because they were just setting those up. Um, one of our staff went and helped at Forever Homes, which was taking in all the dogs and animals because as people were being evacuated, they couldn't take them to the shelters. So that this Forever Homes was taking in um, hundreds of animals over, well, for they had them for several months, a lot of them. Um, and then one of our staff was helping um, with the logistics of donations and the donations that were coming in and transporting donations back and forth between shelters and everything else. So the first day, myself and uh, our family services manager um, went to one of the shelters that was just opening up. It was the second one, and it was at um, Trinity Lutheran Church. Um, and we got there right as they were opening, um, and people were coming in, still kind of not really sure what was happening, just thinking, oh, this will just be a couple hours, nothing really big going on. Um, and then as the day progressed and evening came, people are starting to realize um, we're going to be here overnight and we're going to be here maybe for a while. Um, we had several um, elderly people come in that, um, and disabled people come in that would have had a very hard time sleeping on air mattresses or on the floor. Um, so people in the church... Um, volunteered to take them into their homes so they had a bed to sleep in. Um, we had several, um, a large part of the community that was hit was a Spanish-speaking community. So we had quite a few families there that did not speak a lot of English. Um, probably the family, see it makes me cry, the family I remember the most um, was a little lady that came in with three children. One of them was an infant and they had found her under a bridge, just they were huddled under the bridge um, and a friend of mine her dad had found them and you know he knew she would be hesitant about going with him as a stranger so she he called his daughter and said would you talk to her and tell her it's okay to come with me and I'll get her out of here and so they did that and she they brought her to the shelter um, but the kids were just shivering because they were wet and cold sorry <laughs> um, and that was probably the, the most impactful part to me because there were many families that were out there that were going through the same thing. We were not seeing them all. We were just seeing a portion of them. Um, many families went to churches, their own churches, um, especially that Spanish-speaking community. They went to a lot of the Spanish-speaking churches um, who took them in and let them stay there. There were three and four families living in small homes and apartments. Um, and that is still going on to this day, even though a lot of people don't realize that. There are still many people that are not home um, and are living with other people. So that's kind of what happened that night. Um, the community was amazing. We had donations coming in right and left. Um, when we realized that people were going to have to stay, somebody put out a call for um, air mattresses. Uh, every single air mattress in Menards, Walmart, anywhere that had them, people went and purchased. So people were that were not helping were helping by purchasing items that were needed. Um, initially, we had to feed all those people as well. So um, the first few days, Raising Cane's donated food for everybody until they were out of chicken. Um, then Hy-Vee stepped up and was doing all the, the food catering for all the shelters. So um, within the first week, there were six shelters open with over 650 people in those shelters. Um, we were also trying to feed people in some of the churches that were not official shelters um, because they were trying, you know, the people of the church were trying to feed them. And when they had like 100 people there, that's kind of hard to do on your own, um, especially when we get to the point where grocery stores were running out of food. So people were bringing in whatever they could, um, but I, I was just amazed at the community and how everybody stepped up. Um, the other thing that I really, that impacted me as well is that everywhere I went, whether it was a shelter or you saw people um, doing sandbags, filling them and trying to stop the water, everywhere we went, um, I saw one of our Habitat families out there helping, even the ones that were displaced from their homes. They were out there helping sandbag, they were um, serving meals, they were translating, 
they were um, working in the shelters, they were anywhere we went, we saw them. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so we had the shelters going. We immediately, there is a team of mostly nonprofits, um, emergency response, Red Cross, um, those kinds of groups. We started meeting daily, um, every afternoon to figure out what the next step was, what we needed to do, what the needs were for people. Um, we had a lot of people that had to leave without clothing, so people were also donating clothing. Um, we had people that left without medications because, I mean, it got to the point where, you know, they knew something was happening, but then it was sudden that they came in and said, you have to leave now or you're not going to get out. Um, so people without medications um, and Three Rivers Health Department came in and was trying to coordinate with the pharmacies in town to get everybody the um, medications they needed. Some people needed, um, what are they, we had a couple people that needed CPAP machines, so we had to track those down through pharmacies. Um, we have, Habitat has a store where we take donated items and sell them to help us raise funds. Um, so we went and got all our recliners out of there because there are some people that couldn't lay down. They had to sleep sitting up. So we got all our recliners and took them to the shelters so people could use those to sleep in. Um, so all this was happening. We had no idea what we were doing. We were just trying to do whatever we could do to help. Um, Habitat International plays a big role in disasters. Habitat Fremont had never thought about it before. <laughs> <laughs> Not really did anything about it. Um, but what was awesome was Habitat International. Like the second day, somebody from the disaster department called me, and she just started sending me information. She said, you're going to need this. You're going to need to know how to do this. You're going to need to connect with these people. Um, if you need something, this is who you're going to call. And she just started sending me information right and left um, and checking in with me every day to make sure we were OK and that we didn't need anything. Um, so that was very help helpful. And Habitat in Omaha also reached out to us because we are, um, at the time, we had seven staff. Three of those are part time. So we're not a big organization. Omaha has over 100 employees. Um, so they reached out to us because they have people that are trained in disaster. And so they called us and said, you know, whatever you need, we can help. Um, and as soon as the roads opened up and people could get from Omaha to Fremont, they sent some people to help us and to train people that wanted to clean out homes for others and, and do stuff like that. So we just had so much support from the community, from other organizations. Um, and I think, I think that's what it's all about. I mean, I think that's how a community should be. Um, and I think that's how people should work together. Um, as part of all that, we had um, 26 of our Habitat families were impacted in the flood. They, um, the part that we built in, or the part that was flooded, was a floodplain, but it didn't used to be a floodplain, so we used to, get lots donated because it is the lower, like I said, lower income part of the community. So people would donate lots to us and we would build there because it was less expensive. Um, then it turned into a floodplain. They made it a floodplain, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago maybe. Uh, so we had 26 families and since then we have not built in that area because we didn't want to put families into that area if we didn't have to. But we had 26 families that were affected. Um, I think at this point, all of them are home except for one who is still not home. Um, we had probably half of them that could not return home right away. Um, some could, some were not as damaged as others. That very first family I told you about, Trino Nuno, their house was damaged. Um, but he got in there and he took care of everything right off the bat, and so they're fine at this point. Um, like I said, we have others that are not fine. They're still trying to get the mold cleaned up. They're still trying to get their basements dried out. Um, there's all kinds of things that are going on in those homes. Um, most of them, ha I mean, well, I think all our habitat homes had basements, and which is where furnace and water heater are. And when water got in there, um, those were shot in both, all of all those that were affected. Um, 
And so the city, when they came through, they turned off electricity. And so they, some of them, like the one that's still not in her house, she, um, she had to have everything rewired because it got into the electrical parts of the house in the basement. So I think she, we just got her electricity on last week so we could get some fans running to try and dry out the basement because um, it was still pretty dry. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had many, many groups. Um, most of them, I think, or if not all of them, were some kind of church organization. Um, and those groups came in initially, and they would go out and pull out all the wet stuff. So there were piles and piles of trash those first few weeks outside, um, which, is, which consisted of everybody's, all their belongings in the basements, because everything in the basement, once it got wet, um, unless it was metal, would be ruined um, or um, susceptible to mold. Um, in addition, they had a lot of, in that area, because of some of the overflow of the rain and the flooding, um, there was E. coli rampant in the area. So nothing could be saved. It was all sent to the dump. Um, those groups also started cutting out drywall and pulling insulation on all the houses. Um, a few weeks after that, we had groups come in and um, scrub the walls and clean or spray stuff for, to um, keep from the mold growing. Um, and then we still had continued, there's more groups coming in as we go that are then in the process of rebuilding. So we finally got to the point of what we call rebuilding and recovery. Um, it feels like it's taken a really long time to get here. But every group that comes in, other groups from outside of the state that come in, um, like FEMA, Red Cross, all those, tell us that we are very far ahead of schedule. That most people are, have, are not to the point where we are this far out. Um, it takes six to eight months before they get to where we are. So I guess we feel good about that. Um, I always say, though, that doesn't help the person that can't go home yet. Um, doesn't matter to them that we're farther ahead if they're still not home. Um, so we still have a lot of homes that are growing mold, um, and we're trying to stop that whenever we come across one. We have people, I had two people just this week that came to me and said, I need help. Um, we can't get in our house. There's mold in there. It's, get, it's still wet. Um, and they just don't, number one, they don't know what to do. And number two, they don't have either the ability or the funds to do it. Because um, it doesn't cost much to take out the mold and the insulation and the drywall, but it costs a lot to start putting it in, um, especially if they have to get a furnace and water heater and everything else as part of that. Um, so we, we, I've learned a whole lot more about flood um, and disasters than I can say I ever wanted to know about. Um, but we kind of all had to do that as we went along. Um, so we've had groups coming in consistently from all over the country. And we have groups scheduled. Um, I think the one that we have scheduled farthest out is probably October they're coming in. Um, and, though, and we haven't even put the word out yet that we need help because we're trying to get organized and make sure we're, we're ready to to manage those people. Um, we just hired a construction manager for our flood repairs. That's all he's gonna do is flood repairs. He's full time. Um, he's only been on the job for two weeks and yesterday was his first day off because we have had so much going on. Um, and then he took today off too. I told him he had to take today off. So we're just getting to that point. So now he is assessing the homes to see if they can be fixed, if they cannot be fixed, um, what needs done, what it's going to cost. Um, and then we have a committee that's going to meet and determine if there's some of the funds can be used. I mean, there's been money collected, but there's not enough money for everybody that needs everything um, in our community. That doesn't even, that's just Fremont. That doesn't include North Bend, which was hit pretty badly, and um, Winslow, which was hit very badly, and is likely gonna have to move their community or come, come some kind of decision about what they're gonna do. And those funds that have been collected go to all those communities. Um, 
I think I've covered the basics about what we've done um, and how it's been. Uh, like I said, there are still homes that um, need a lot of work. It, it's just not visible from the exterior. You have to go inside. Um, there was a few that were hit and windows were broken out. I think we had three of our habitat homes where the water was coming through so quickly. Their egress windows were broken out. So their basements filled all the way to the top. Um, but m m there's still uh, a lot of people that need help. And I, th I, th I think there's a lot out there that we don't even know about yet because they don't want to ask for help or um, they don't know how to ask for help, they haven't received the information. Um, so it's just, I think they're, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be working for a while trying to get everybody back to where they were before the flood. Um, so I think, I don't know in this setting if I can open up the questions or not. Do them afterwards? Okay. So afterwards, I will be um, out there if anybody has any questions. I put a whole bunch of information out there as well that um, is about habitat, um, primarily about habitat. We don't have a lot of written information specific for the flood, but um, if anybody's interested in volunteering or helping out in any way, my card's out there. Um, you can just let us know, give us a call, and we will, we will be working on that pretty intensely. Um, starting here in the next couple weeks. I think that is about all I have. 